I will be giving him a more lengthy and in-depth introduction tomorrow at the debate, but I just want to say Dr. Tony Costa is the professor of apologetics and Islam at Toronto Baptist Seminary. He's an author, and he's been a guest on the Iron Sharp Design radio program. I'm looking forward to having him back on the program many times. And without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Tony Costa to the podium to bless you today with the word. Well, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's a great pleasure to be here, coming from Canada, being part of God's frozen chosen, and coming down to be among my American brothers and sisters. And thank you, Chris, for the fine introduction. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the time that we spent on Iron Sharpens Iron. It's also a great privilege for me to be with my good friend, uh, Dr. David Wood, as well, whom I uh, highly esteem. I want to talk to you this afternoon about the subject of postmodernism, the worldview that is pervading our Western society and is also affecting our churches. And that will serve as a segue into my next topic. I also want to talk about something called cultural Marxism, which is related to the postmodern view and which you will notice is infiltrating our universities, our colleges, our government, our way of thinking, the Western way of thinking is imbibing this ideology that is absolutely destructive to our Christian foundations, destructive to our young people, and it's something that we have to contend with. And we're told in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly. We do not use physical weapons to wage war as other groups and religions do like Islam. But rather our weapons are spiritual and they are also powerful. And what are they powerful to do? To bring down strongholds, particularly arguments that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. And so the world of apologetics really boils down to a clash of worldviews. It is a battle of the mind. And where is the worldview mostly promulgated but in our educational systems and in our churches? So our job as believers in Christ is to tear down arguments. It's what Paul calls logismos, reasonings that are used by the unbelieving world. And therefore, our, um, our mission is to challenge these worldviews, whether it is atheism, agnosticism, whether it's moral relativism or, or Islam, whatever it may be, and to bring them under the subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, under the Lordship of Christ. Now, let me just say something about modernism. Well, obviously postmodernism implies that there's something that follows modernism. Well, modernism really began in the early 20th century and the emphasis in modernism was science, that science was the true venue of knowledge, that we could perfectly know things uh, by knowledge, it could explain everything. But the problem with this view was that people began to realize that if science can explain everything, then how can we account for certain things like beauty? Does science prove whether something is beautiful or not? Well, no, it cannot pass aesthetic judgments. Can science prove the laws of logic? Well, no, it cannot do that. It doesn't have the jurisdiction to do that. Can science tell you whether a rose is beautiful or ugly? No, it cannot. And so the idea was that science could explain everything and unless it could be proven by science, then we really cannot accept anything to be true. Well, that wasn't very long lived, was it? Where did we get this idea from? I think it's important that we realize that much of liberal thinking today finds its roots in the Enlightenment period. When we go back to the Enlightenment period, the 18th century, there was a movement in Western Europe that had serious ramifications to Western thinking. If you remember the Enlightenment period, which literally means the, the, the coming on of, of, of light and knowledge and so forth, the Enlightenment period was known also as the age of reason. It was the time when man rediscovered himself, he rediscovered the Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, and this gave birth to the view that we know today as humanism or secular humanism. 
And what this view said basically was that man was the summit of all things, that man was the one that could interpret his origins, his existence, his fate, and that there is nothing supernatural. All that we know is what we can deduce by reason. And of course, this is where we get the worldview known as naturalism, that everything that exists can be accounted for as natural causes. And it was also during this period that while the enlightenment is going on in the 18th century, there were some folks that didn't want to give up on God. And so you had the creation of what was known as the deists, not the theists, but the deists, D-E-I-S-T. Some of your founding fathers were deists. They were willing to believe that, yes, God created the universe and that God was the foundation to objective moral meaning, but the deists taught God does not engage or interfere with human affairs. And so this is why, if you notice, the American Revolution was very different than another revolution that occurred 13 years later, namely the French Revolution. You'll notice the major difference between these two revolutions. They did have similarities. Both of them were revolutions against the crown. And so the American Revolution was a revolution against the British crown. The French Revolution was a revolution against the French crown. And with the creation of the Republic in France, they toppled the French monarchy. With the creation of the Republic of America, they did not topple, obviously, the King of England, but they ceded from English rule. But you will notice that there are two distinctive differences between these revolutions. The French Revolution was a purely humanistic revolution. It not only toppled the king, but it also tried to eradicate the church. It tried to eradicate anything that resembled Christianity to the point that all that mattered was secular thinking, secular humanism. And there was a man in, the, in France by the name of Robespierre, and Robespierre understood the problem that if we remove God out of the picture, we will become like tyrants, we'll become animals, we will simply become tyrannical leaders without an ultimate foundation for our morality. And Robespierre argued that we should believe in a supreme being, because how else can we have objective morality? Well, eventually, Robespierre was led to the guillotine and killed, proving his point. The American Revolution was very different. He lost his head over it. Um, the, French, the American Revolution was very different because you'll notice the American Revolution recognized that all humans are created, in, uh, given, they're given inalienable rights and that they're created equal and that these rights are endowed by their creator. Now, even though they were deists and didn't believe that God necessarily engaged in the world, that's why Thomas Jefferson had his cut and paste syndrome uh, with the Bible, um, there was something that happened. The Puritans left a lasting legacy in this country that influenced the founding fathers. People like John Wesley and George Whitfield. When George Whitfield would come to the Americas and he would preach in Massachusetts out in the open fields, Benjamin Franklin would go out to hear him at times. Franklin was influenced a lot by, by Whitfield's preaching. And it was that influence of Christianity that gave the American Constitution that piety, if you will, that concept of these rights that humans share are given by God. And because humans are made in the imago dei, the image of God, they have inherent dignity and rights. That was something that the French Revolution did not have. And so it was the influence of Christianity that gave the American Constitution its theistic ring, if you will, that solidity. Now, when we look at the Enlightenment that occurred in the 1700s, uh, you have to ask the question, why did it happen in that time in Western Europe? Well, I think we have to understand what happened the two centuries before that. The two centuries prior to the Enlightenment, there was another movement that occurred in Western Europe that rocked the foundations of Europe and that still have impact in the Western world. And what was that that occurred in the 1500s? Well, we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of that event, the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation argued that the primary way of knowing God was not through human reason, but through revelation. The elevated revelation 
And they said that reason was subservient to revelation. Not that we don't use reason, but that reason is subservient to revelation. And so the emphasis of the Reformation was sola scriptura, that the scriptures give us what we need to know about God in terms of faith and practice. The Enlightenment was a reaction to the Reformation in maintaining we don't need revelation, we have reason. And so really it's the battle of the two R's, if you will, revelation and reason. It's not from the top down, God revealing himself, it's from the bottom up. We don't need God, we don't need the Bible, we don't need revelation. Man is autonomous. And now we are back to Genesis 3. What is Genesis 3 all about? It is the act of declaring autonomy. What is autonomy? Two Greek words, autos and nomos, meaning a law to oneself. So from the very beginning, man has sought to be, sinful man has sought to be autonomous, meaning he is a law to himself. He does not need God. He can rule his own self. He's the master of his own destiny and so forth. And when we look at this ideology of the Enlightenment, what did this do? Well, it argued that man was autonomous, that man was free to do what he wished, that meaning and purpose and life are made up by reason. There is no absolute morality, no objective morality. Everything is relative because since God does not exist, there is no objective anchor or source. And the origin of the cosmos and life and everything else is just simply the product of chance. Now, what was the influence of this thinking in the church? Well, in the 1800s, this type of thinking birthed what we know today as higher criticism. And so in the 1800s, in Germany, particularly in Germany, which is interesting, the very country where the Protestant Reformation started, also became the origin of biblical higher criticism. This is the thinking that created people like Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, this is the thinking that created uh, scholars who are what we would call today liberals or higher critics. And what is the argument of higher criticism? We can't know for sure that God has spoken. We cannot know for sure that the Bible is God's word. And therefore, this gave way to what we call liberal theology. And then it would give way to another movement called the social gospel, put forward by people like Schleiermacher, for example. And so we have to understand that the thinking that we see today, folks, did not, did not just come out of a vacuum. Things are not just created out of a vacuum. They have these sources. Now, when we look at this postmodern view, we have to ask the question, what is so attractive about this? Well, a lot of folks today say that we live in a postmodern age. And what that means is that we do not know and cannot know absolute truth. If you were to ask someone what is true, they would usually say something like, well, whatever you think is true, or whatever you believe is true for you. It may not be true for me, but it's all relative at the end of the day. And so you see, when we lose faith in something that is objective like truth, well, what are we left with? Well, who defines truth? In the Christian worldview, God defines what is true. But if God does not exist, then what defines truth? Well, it's the government, it's the people, uh, it's the majority vote, et cetera, et cetera. And so we see that today. You look at the subject of abortion and people will say, well, uh, it's up to the woman. It's a woman's choice whether or not she wants to abort the child. It's, it's dependent on your particular worldview. Postmodernism also claims to be tolerant. You'll hear this word a lot, tolerance. It will claim that it is, it is tolerant of, of all views, that it does not discriminate. And yet, when push comes to shove, you will find that people today who claim to be the most tolerant are the most intolerant when their views are challenged. And you'll also notice that um, when you look at some of our churches today, you will notice that churches that are affected by this most modern thinking will tend to water down the gospel, they will water down the sanctity of marriage. They will tell you that, um, that God loves everyone indiscriminately and that God would not punish anyone and so forth. These are all influences that we get from this particular world view. And so it's interesting when the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we're told in John 18, when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared before Pilate and Pontius Pilate had him flogged, 
I don't have time to go into the details of what Roman flogging was. Let me just say it was one of the most brutal things that could be inflicted on a human being. But after the Lord Jesus was flogged, we're told that he was brought before Pilate and Pilate asked him this interesting question. He said, are you a king? And Jesus said, you have said it. In other words, yes. He says, for this purpose I was born to give testimony to the truth. And everyone who hears the truth hears my voice. And then Pilate asked this very interesting question of him. He looked at his face as the blood was streaming down from his scalp from the crown of thorns that were shoved into his scalp. He looks into his face and says, what is truth? And if you read the gospel account, Jesus does not answer that question. And the implication there, the ironic implication is, you're looking at it. You're staring the truth, it's right under your nose. The Lord did not answer that question because you see, we know that earlier he had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the irony here is that Christ, Christ demonstrated to us that he was not just a way among many ways. He wasn't a prophet like other prophets, just one among many. He says, I am the way, not a truth or a measure of truth. I am the truth. I am the source of life. And so under this worldview, what do we have? Well, in moral relativism, there are really no objective morals. And so certain things like murder and rape and spousal abuse, these are things that really in an, in a the, in an atheistic worldview, you cannot justify. I remember years ago, I was doing a lecture at a university in Toronto. I was speaking on the existence of God and uh, an atheist came up to me before I went up and says, can I grill you now or grill you later? And I said, well, you can grill me later. I'll be well done by then. And uh, so uh, he came up during the Q&A. He was the first person in line to ask the question. And uh, he began to say, well, you believe in, 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 in God and, and, and you assume that God exists and therefore you believe that, that morality is, is objective and absolute. And, and I said to him, I said, well, yes, I do believe it's absolute and objective. I said, but as an atheist, uh, what would you say about rape? He said, excuse me? I said, what would you say about rape? And I'll never forget the answer he gave me. He said, it depends on the culture. I said, you mean there are certain cultures that advocate rape? Now at this point, there were some, there were some sisters sitting in the back of the room. And these sisters also claimed to be moral relativists when they first came in. And all of a sudden, one of them in the back said, say what? And I learned right away that this is a dangerous sign. When the head starts bopping and the hand comes up like this, that is a dangerous sign. These women were ready to grab this guy, take him outside and lynch him and burn him at the stake. All of a sudden, they went from being moral relativists to believing in objective morality in a matter of a minute. And I said, now hold on. I said, do you understand what you are saying? You are saying that it's permissible to violate a woman and that there's nothing objective and evil about that. But I said, as an atheist, you would have to argue that because do not animals forcibly uh, copulate in the wild? Don't animals rape one another? Sure they do. But when we apply this to humans, we don't say, well, you know, since we're evolved animals, Darwin argued we're evolved animals, so therefore, when we commit the things that animals commit, it's perfectly fine. Well, no, it's not. There's something wrong here. And so I said, your worldview cannot condemn rape. Your worldview cannot condemn murder. And then I said to him, it's people like you that make me believe that the Bible is true. He got very indignant with me. And I said, do you fear God? He said, no, the Bible says there's no fear of God before their eyes. I said, do you delight in the, in the law of God? He says, absolutely not. The Bible says those in the flesh cannot delight in, in the things of God. I said, what do you think about the, the death of Christ on the cross? He says, that's a pathetic doctrine. What type of a God would send his son? I said, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. I said, every time you open your yak, you prove the Bible's true. <laughs> I said, the Bible even speaks about you. He says, it does? He was excited about it. I said, yes, yeah, Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And, you know, I really think April Fool's Day should be the atheist holiday. 
I mean, really, think about it. April Fool's Day would be the perfect holiday for the atheist. But my whole point was to show that, you see, without, without the existence of God and without the gospel, human beings would, would be deprived of their dignity and, and of, of their human rights. When we talk about human rights, and as Americans, I know that rights are very important, but really, outside of God, what rights do you have? Well, where did this thinking come from? Well, this thinking is very prevalent today. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about the, the sister of postmodernism. I want to talk about this thing called cultural Marxism because it is a worldview that is compatible with postmodernism and also it's a worldview that is subversive, that is seeking to undermine Western society. And you're seeing it right now in your universities. Just take a look at what's going on at Yale and look at what's going on with the students talking about getting rid of the founding fathers, getting rid of their pictures, this is all white privilege, and this is this, we need safe space, and some of my friends on, on the blog are calling these people snowflakes because they get so, they were traumatized when Donald Trump won. Uh, they had to go, some of them even canceled their final exams because they were so traumatized by the election, by the fact that he was chosen to be the president of the United States. And if I, was, if I was at the university, I would have given them some color books as well, coloring books to help them. But they were traumatized by this. Think about this is your future. This is the future of this country. These young people are going to become the future leaders of this country. Can you imagine them when it comes to a time of war? They need their safe space to run to? But the consequences are dire. But let me just say something about cultural Marxism. It's very different than Marxist-Leninism. It's a different animal of the old Soviet Union, if you still remember that. You may probably recognize cultural Marxism today by other names such as multiculturalism, political correctness, tolerance, inclusion, safe sex, sensitivity training, post-colonial studies, social justice, diversity, and special interest groups using words like progressive, these are all buzzwords of cultural Marxism. And in this way, they hide the Marxist source. Now, the tracing of the origins, cultural Marxism traces its origins to 1919, around that time, just after the First World War. Karl Marx had argued that the cause of all societal ills was class distinctions, which created economic oppression on the working classes, the oppressed by the proletariat, the, proletariat, the proletariat were the working classes, and the ones that were oppressing them were the ruling business classes known as the bourgeoisie, the capitalists who took advantage of the servants who worked for them. And Marx believed that only a revolution of the working class against the ruling class would bring harmony and peace to society. Marx also believed that the obliteration of class distinctions around the world would eventually bring about what he called a utopian world. Now you have to understand folks, the utopian world is the communist parallel to the kingdom of God. You see what the world does is it substitutes. So the Bible of communism is Das Kapital by Marx. The sin is the class distinctions, economic oppression, and the coming world tomorrow is the utopian world. It is the atheist version of God's kingdom. And Marx believed that when a major war would come, the working classes would rise against their rulers and topple them. Well, World War I came in 1914. Marxists believed that the time for revolution had come. The working class all over Europe were going to rise up against their capitalist rulers and communism would solve the problem. But here's the problem. When the war came in 1914, that did not happen. Millions of people from every working class lined up to register to join the army to fight for their respective countries. While a revolution occurred in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, led by Vladimir Lenin, workers in their European countries did not support this. This was a shock to the Marxist as history was not unfolding according to plan. Now, of course, there were other communist uh, establishments like that in uh, in China under Mao in 1949, and of course, Fidel Castro, who has gone to his place now, um, in the Cuban Revolution of 1959. And we also witnessed the breaking down, the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 26th of 1991. The old Marxist idea was abandoned, but it was not completely. 
It was replaced by a nuanced approach. The way that they felt, the new Marxists, was to subvert the West or the capitalist world through culture, not economics. How did they do this? Well, there were two Marxist theorists by the name of Antonio Gramsci in Italy and Greg Lukács in Hungary. And they viewed that the problem, the reason why Marxism was not proceeding was because of two major obstacles. Number one, Western culture and values, which was based on number two, Christianity. It realized that it would take time to dismantle Christianity as it had been around for almost 2,000 years. The working classes were infected with the Christian idea of the nuclear family, which was the view that you have a husband, a wife, and a child. The West had to be de-Christianized. Christianity had to be uprooted, and this could only happen by a slow march through the institutions of academia. That's why you see this happening in the academic world. And it goes without saying that cultural Marxism, just like its predecessor, Marxism, believed that religion was the major obstacle, Christianity. That, as Marx said, religion is the opiate of the people. It is a drug. It makes you think of another world, another kingdom, and therefore you lose sight of the here and now. It hindered progress. By destroying Christianity and the Judeo-Christian principles on which Western civilization was based, the whole Western world would eventually collapse. Whatever Christianity exalted, they argued, should be made deplorable. Whatever Christianity found deplorable, they exalted. And this would be a matter of pride for them. The subversion of values, this is very important. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, who is known as the father of nihilism. Now, what is nihilism? Nihilism is the philosophy that there is no meaning, no purpose in life. He's the one who declared the death of God. Remember at the University of Toronto, some of the weirdest things you read on the wall is in the bathrooms. I remember in the bathroom they had this, you know, you've heard of the writing on the wall? Well, there was a line there that said, God is dead, signed Friedrich Nietzsche. And underneath it, it said, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. <laughs> Frederick Nietzsche talked about the transvaluation of values, and what he meant by that is that values would not mean what they mean. They would lose, excuse me, lose their uh, objective meaning. And what the cultural Marxists did was they began to emphasize emphasizing the rights of certain groups like women's rights, racial minorities, criminal rights, and so forth. I'm going to come back to that very soon. Now, one of Lukács, Lukács was the Hungarian neo-Marxist, uh, neo one of the first things he did was to introduce sex education into Hungary's public schools. And he knew that if the West's traditional sexual morals could be destroyed, that this would inevitably lead to the destruction of Western culture, including Christianity. He spoke of free love and he mocked Christian views of marriage and monogamy. Sound familiar? He showed graphic sexual images in his classes. He also encouraged rebellion against parents. The family unit, and the family unit he understood, and cultural Marxists understood, was a Christian concept. And so this would lead, for instance, so by, by arguing this type of thinking, this would lead to uh, what we've seen today in our modern society, family breakdowns, rise in abortion. All of these ideologies, folks, are fruits of this type of thinking. But what is interesting about the cultural Marxists is they will blame all of these things in Western society, but yet they're the ones who've contributed to it, but they claim to be the protectors of these people who are the oppressed. And so it's no surprise today that when we look at groups like Planned Parenthood, that was founded by Margaret Sanger, a well-known eugenicist, who believed that certain minorities were weeds in society that needed to be eradicated, it's no surprise that we find abortion clinics usually located in areas of higher populations of these minorities. There's no surprise, I and mean, you're all familiar with the whole issue of uh, selling baby parts and organ parts and, and so forth that Planned Parenthood was involved in. And so they saw academia as the best venue to accomplish these goals of subverting the West and its foundation. Now, the great universities, after all, were the creations of the church. What better place to subvert them? And it's for this reason that cultural Marxism is the most successful in conquering academic institutions here in the West, in Europe, North America, and 
Australia. Now, in 1923, inspired in part by Lukács, the Hungarian neo-Marxist, a group of German Marxists established a think tank in Frankfurt University in Germany, and they called it the Institute for Social Research. This institute same came, soon came to be known simply as the Frankfurt School, and this school would become the creator of cultural Marxism. Other, other uh, uh, prominent members of the cultural Marxist school were people like Max Horkheimer, Theodor Adorno, Wilhelm Reich, Eric Fromm, and Herbert Marcuse. You check these guys out, they are giants in this area. And they began to engineer very carefully and insidiously methods by which they can bring down Western culture and Christianity. Now things did not go too well for the Frankfurt School in the 1930s because Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933. And obviously the Frankfurt School couldn't last there. You didn't need to destroy Western civilization. The Nazi party could do that very well, thank you very much. And so for obvious reasons they fled Germany and where did they reestablish themselves? They reestablished themselves in New York City. The focus was the same. Instead of destroying Christianity on European soil, they now moved their attention to the United States. And while they were here in the United States, they invented a school or a thought, a school of thought known as critical theory, which I'm sure you've heard of. But what was the theory? The theory was, now note this, to criticize, denigrate every traditional institution, starting with the nuclear family, by redefining the family by redefining sexual relationships. Now, this has already happened in my country. Just this past month, in December, our provincial legislature in Ontario passed a bill called Bill C-16, where they have redefined the family. The family no longer means a man and a woman and a child. The family now can mean a man and a man, a woman and a woman, a man and a woman, and up to four people who contractually agree to be in relationship with each other and could choose to adopt a child as their own. The federal government in Canada, just in December, both our federal leader and our provincial leader are completely in the left side of things and politically. Uh, the federal government just passed a law, Bill 28, that has included sexual gender identity into the Criminal Code of Canada, what that means is that people who do not identify as male or female, but are gender neutral or non-binary, people who choose their own pronouns, there are people, there's a big debate right now in, in Toronto at the university uh, where I teach, where one of the professors is now under fire because he refuses to call people by their designated pronouns. So some people don't identify as he or she. They want to be called Zer or, or they. There's one person who doesn't identify as a human, he, he identifies as, a, as an animal and wants to be called worm self. Now folks, you have to understand, it, it's, it's eventually gonna come here. It usually it's the other way around. There's a proverb in Canada that, that the United States, when the United States sneezes, Canada catches the cold. Um, or that the United States is like an elephant, uh, it lying in bed with you, every move it makes you feel. Uh, and so, it's happened already in my country. My country is no longer a Christian country. It has not been a Christian country for a long time. And our prime minister, who claims to be an alleged Catholic, has made it a rule of thumb that no one can be part of his party, the Liberal Party, unless they are pro-choice. You have no choice in the matter, yet he claims to be a faithful Catholic. And it's already happened there. They also wrote a series of books on studies in prejudice. This is a huge buzzword, prejudice which argued that anyone who believes in the traditional uh, family is either a racist, sexist, or their favorite term, a fascist, and that they're mentally ill, and that they have a sense of presumptuous privilege. Cultural Marxism will tell you that they'll always tell you what they are against, not necessarily what they stand for. So you'll notice that whenever you confront people like that, you'll always hear things like, you're a bigot, you're a fascist, you're homophobic. You're Islamophobic. You'll always notice that it's always an attack. It's, it's not what they stand for, it's what they're against. Some of this critical theory involves things like cultural studies, 
post-colonial studies, women's studies, Aboriginal studies or Native American studies, African American studies, LGBTQ plus two, and there's that, that abbreviation is always growing, I can't even keep, keep up. Um, but all of these studies, folks, are all childs of cultural Marxism, because they're all based on the oppressor-oppressed paradigm that Marx talked about. Women, for example, are victims of a patriarchy. Women are told that Christianity is misogynist, that Christianity is a male-centered religion, that God has male pronouns and God has titles. The African Americans were enslaved by white Christians who worship a white Jesus, and that it was the Christian white man who killed the Native Americans when they came here. The LGBTQ community is condemned by Christians who are homophobic. And so you could see that deep-seated anger against the West and Christianity is the cause of all evils. In the 1950s, Herbert Marcuse created a coalition of black students and feminist women and homosexuals and told them that the reason for their oppression was Western civilization, particularly Christianity. And he defined their struggle as an oppressor, oppressed paradigm. But here's the catch, folks. Cultural Marxism eventually made their way to Hollywood. And during the war years after World War II, they went to Hollywood because they realized that the media, there's a professor, a famous professor from Canada, um, who uh, McLuhan was his name, who was famous for saying that the medium is the message. They went to Hollywood because they believed that the media and entertainment world was where they believed they could promulgate their ideology more effectively. And we see the fruits of this even today, where Hollywood has become the most powerful leftist ideological medium to communicate all forms of sexual perversion as normative with a systemic hatred against anything deemed Christian, which is derisively mocked in the media and in the film screens, while all other religions are exalted as noble, victimized, and being marginalized by the West. They instituted the studies on prejudice where Christianity was the enemy and was accused of being fascist, and Christians are fascists. After World War II, most members of the Frankfurt School returned to Germ Germany. Marcuse stayed in America. He wrote the book Eros and Civilization. He argued for free sex, which bloomed in the 1960s with the sexual revolution. And he also taught all types of sexual liberation. He coined the phrase, you may have heard this phrase, make love, not war. That's Marcuse. He also argued for what we called liberating tolerance. He defined liberating tolerance as tolerance for all ideas coming from the left and intolerance as those coming from the right. Sound familiar? Special interest groups who champion tolerance, as I said, you'll find to be the most intolerant. Post-colonialism, for instance, blames all the world's ills on the West and their oppressive incursion and imperialism into other cultures, the Middle East, India, Africa, and the exploitation of those cultures. Cultural Marxists, for example, will blame the British as the creators of the caste system in India, which is in fact an ancient concept rooted in Hinduism and has been practiced for millennia before the British colonized India. For example, the British abolished the practice of sati. Now in Hinduism, there's a practice, S-A-T-I. Sati is the practice of widow burning. And what happens is if a husband predeceases his wife, it is the duty of the wife to throw herself or be thrown on the funeral pyre of her husband while he's being cremated so that she could die and join him in the afterlife. The British outlawed that. The British also outlawed the practice. There was a practice of throwing infants, unwanted infants, at alligators or crocodiles uh, because they believed these animals to be divine manifestations of gods. The British also outlawed that practice. And so you could see here that all of the world's ills is blamed on what? Western civilization and Christianity. Let's look at, for example, the slave trade, which is blamed on the West and their greed. We hear a lot about the slave trade, but you'll notice that you hear next to nothing about the Eastern slave trade. You'll forget the fact that they'll never tell you about the fact that Islam began the slave trade long before the Western Europeans got involved. They won't tell you about the fact that Muslims would capture 
these back slaves, and what they would do is they would castrate the males to make sure that they would not reproduce when they took them back into Arabia. They'd simply take the black women and take them as sex slaves and have children through them. But the men would be castrated, something the Western uh, slave traders did not do. I'm not trying to justify the Western side, but what I'm saying is, how many textbooks in high school were you taught about the involvement of Islam in the slave trade? Next to nil. Next to nil. They won't tell you about the fact that there were black tribes in Africa enslaving other black tribes. They will never tell you that. That's a fact of history. But they will never tell you that. Because it goes against the, the cultural Marxist ideology. The oppression of Native Americans blamed on the West, that the whites came and they, they invaded their countries. And they will never tell you about the fact that Native Americans obliterated other Native American tribes. Up in Canada, our Native Ameri our Aboriginal people, we call them, uh, the Hurons were completely wiped out by the Iroquois. There are no Hurons left in Canada. They were wiped out by another tribe known as the Iroquois. You won't hear that. 9-11, when 9-11 happened, Time Magazine came out with a front cover article that said, why are they so angry at us? Whose fault was 9-11? The West. We caused 9-11. It's our fault. We bothered them. We inflicted harm on them. We went to the Middle East. And so it's our fault. Another area is on the subject of the Crusades. The Crusades today get a bad rap that, well, it was the power-hungry Pope that wanted to take over the Holy Land and he wanted to fight these Muslims and these poor innocent Muslims were just minding their own business and Western Christendom decides to come and decides to send waves of Crusades. And what they will never tell you is that the Crusades was a 400 year response to the Islamic incursion and invasion of the world. All of the lands they took over, folks, were all Christian lands. The Middle East was all Christian. North Africa was a bastion of Christianity. Augustine was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. The School of Alexandria, where we get some of the great church fathers, uh, including Cyril of Alexandria and think of people like Origen and others. All of that today, North Africa is all Muslim. The Middle East is all Muslim. Turkey, the center of the Byzantium Kingdom. Constantinople, the second Rome, was a bastion of Eastern Christendom. And in 1453, the Muslim Turks went in and destroyed the city, raped the women, took the children as slaves, and imposed Sharia law. No one talks about that today. Instead, we get movies like The Kingdom of Heaven that make it look like Christians just wanted to kill and rape and pillage and so forth and so on. They never tell you that it was a response to the Islamic incursion. I know that Chris was talking uh, with one uh, academic from um, uh, an academic in uh, Spanish history where he wrote the book the, the Myth of the Andalusian Paradise where he simply rips apart this idea that uh, Islamic Spain was this golden age of Islam. It was nothing of the sort, folks. Don't imbibe this. This is, the West, this is cultural Marxist ideology trying to blame everything on the West. Now, let me just say a couple more things and then I will close. Some terms you may be familiar with, terms like homophobia, transphobia. And now the Muslims, the Muslim Brotherhood has jumped on the bandwagon and now the Muslim Brotherhood has come up with their own term, Islamophobia. Now what do these terms mean? Well, there's a lady in Canada that I work with at the university, she's a professed lesbian, and she said to me, she said, uh, Tony, what's your views on homosexuality? I said, do you want me to be honest with you? Or do you want me to be politically correct? She said, I want you to be honest. Oh, well, so the Bible says this, A, B, C, D, etc. She says, oh, you're a homophobe. I said, you're a heterophobe. She said, what's a heterophobe? I said, what's a homophobe? <laughs> I said, a phobia is an irrational fear of something. If you look up the word phobia in your dictionaries, they will say a phobia is an irrational fear of something. I said, I don't have an irrational fear of homosexuals. I'm talking to you. Do you have an irrational fear of me? She says, no. I said, then why do we throw these? I said, these are just politically charged words, politically incorrect charged words that we throw at each other to censor each other. And so when I speak against Islam, they, you're an Islamophobic. And I ask them, are you Christophobic? Do you have a phobia against Christianity? No, why would I have? I mean, I don't have an irrational fear of Islam. I have a rational fear of Islamic terrorism. <laughs> but I don't have an irrational fear of Islam. Irrational fear is to say Islam is a religion of peace. That's irrational. Irrational fear is to say, these guys want to kill us and it's our duty to protect ourselves and our 
families. My brother David Wood can tell you all about that. He knows, he's bought the t-shirt and he's been there. He knows the whole story. So these terms are, are products of cultural Marxism. They're ways to silence criticism. They're ways to shut you down. In the homosexual community, for instance, when's the last time you heard something about AIDS? Have you noticed how the AIDS issue has gone down? They don't talk about it anymore. Studies after studies are coming out of the Harvard Medical School that are showing the, the implications of the homosexual community, the, the lifestyle that they're engaged in, the, the dangers of that type of lifestyle. And one doctor at Harvard Medical School was told to shut up, to not publish these, 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 these findings because they would be counterintuitive to the image of the school. Well, what they mean is they would be politically incorrect to talk about these things. You see, folks, truth is now the new hate speech. When we speak the truth, that is what we see today. Now, time does not permit for me to go into uh, many other issues I could mention. We, for example, the, the, the issue that we see going on in Western, in Western Europe, where you'll notice many Europeans are absolutely clueless about the Islamic threat to Europe. You probably know how Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel has simply opened wide the gates and has allowed how many migrants into the country? Even after ICE has said, we are going to pump terrorists through your migration system. They openly said they were going to do this. And it's no surprise. We saw what's happened in Berlin. We saw what's happened in Paris. We saw even Fort Lauderdale just recently. Remember the Orlando shooting? What was that blamed on? There was a lawyer from the ACLU. You know the ACLU. I call them Atheist Communist Liberals United. An ACLU lawyer, you know who he blamed it on? He blamed it on the Christian right and homophobia. Not in its real source, which is Islam. Well, I'm just going to end with this. I'm going to end with the wheel of oppression. Not the wheel of fortune, but the wheel of oppression. There's graphs that uh, Culture Marx has put out, like this one called the Matrix of Oppression, and it's a grading scale. On the far left, they have what's called social identity categories, and then they have privileged social groups, and on the far right, they have targeted social groups. And who are the most privileged social groups? White people, heterosexuals, rich upper-class people, able-bodied people, Protestants, and adults. Who are the most targeted social groups? So you've got the white people on one end, the other end you have Asian, Black, Latino, Native people. That's called racism. On the other side of the spectrum, you have gender-conforming people, that is heterosexuals. On the other right, you have transgender, gender-queer, intersex people. This is transgender oppression. On the other side of sexual orientation, you've got heterosexuals. You are the privileged people, heterosexuals. On the other side, the targeted social groups, lesbians, gay men. And this one really got me. Privileged social groups. You got Protestants on the high grade and on the low grade. These are the targeted social groups. Jews, Muslims, and Hindus. Now remember, the Hindu has the caste system, which basically says that everyone is defined by their class in the, the caste system. Basically, you've got the priest class, the Brahmins, and then you've got the Kshatras, the working class, and then very low at the bottom, you've got what's called the Shudras, the untouchables. They're so unclean you can't touch them. And if your children, if you come from the lowest rung on the ladder and your children are born to you, they cannot get out of their caste. They have to stay in that caste. They will never be able to go to university, college. They cannot marry someone outside of their caste. That, folks, is the worst kind of discrimination that's been around for millennia. And Marxists call that oppressed. These are oppressed peoples. Think about that for a minute. And Muslims. Muslims are targeted social groups. And yet all the terrorist acts we've seen, who are being targeted? Well, primarily the West, those associated with the West. And so why am I telling you all this today? This is not just a, a, a stimulating lecture that I wanted to, to deliver to you today, but what I wanted to show you folks is there is there's rhyme and reason behind the thinking we see today. We are at war. There is a war. And Persecution is coming to the church. It's already happening in Canada. You will notice here in the United States, Christians are being sued for not baking a wedding cake for a gay couple. 
But they will never do the same with a Muslim baker who will also refuse to bake a cake for a gay couple. How do I know? It's been done. They've been, in, they've been filmed asking, would you do a gay, uh, a, a, a gay wedding cake, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, nope, go to another bakery. But you see, the, the ACLU does not go after those folks. It targets Christians. There is a hatred against us. Jesus said it would be so. They will hate you. They will be against you. Why? Because of me. He's the dividing line. He's the rock of stumbling. He's the rock of offense. And so what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Let us take the hymns of the church seriously. Stand up, stand up for Jesus means exactly that. Stand up for Jesus. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Till every foe is, uh, every foe is, is con um, conquered, vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Now is the time to stand up, to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. Now is the time, brothers and sisters, to stand up for such a time as this. We cannot compromise. We cannot compromise. Thank you.